Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails Common Ground, where every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern, we will feature conversations with social justice practitioners, change makers, and activists on how we can mobilize our daily actions to radically reimagine our democracy. I'm Malva Kajali, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a special conversation between artists and co-collaborators Hank Willis Thomas and Paula Crown in conversation with the illustrious Paul D. Miller aka DJ Spooky for a conversation on the 2020 Great Awakening in this nation. We're also thrilled to have the iconic poet Rachel Levitsky here with us today who will read to close today's program. This is the last common ground before November 3rd. Uh, and I'm so thrilled that in this last week, as we all muscle through our civic duties of early voting, that we are able to sit down with the minds behind Four Freedoms and the 2020 Wide Awakes to talk about what it means to show up fully for the movement as our full and whole selves. Uh, the Brooklyn Rail would also like to take a moment to acknowledge the Wappinger, Canarsi, Munsi, and Lenape Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation, the traditional owners of the unceded land and waters on which we stand. Finally, the Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprisings that have been unfolding across and throughout the country this year, following the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McAtee, James Scurlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmed Arbery, Rayshard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, Toyin Salau, and Walter Wallace Jr. And acknowledge that justice will come from the streets, from the nation demanding accountability and refusing to move on until Black Lives Matter in the eyes of the state. Until that day, we will continue to support ongoing action in the struggle for racial justice. Before I introduce our illustrious guests, we invite you to join us for a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce our host, Paul D. Miller, AKA DJ Spooky, is a composer, multimedia artist, and writer whose work immerses audiences in a blend of genres, global culture, and environmental and social issues. Paul Miller has collaborated with an array of recording artists, including Metallica, Chuck D, Steve Reich, and Yoko Ono. His 2018 album, DJ Spooky Presents Phantom Dance Hall, debuted at three uh, at number three on Billboard Reggae. Without further ado, uh, Paul, the floor is yours. All right, um, first and foremost, I just want to thank Hank and Paula for joining us. Um, and by the way, just a small fun aside, I, I'm now the editor at large of the Brooklyn Rail, so I'll be kind of doing some input uh, from the, the cross section of technology, the arts and global you know, culture from the viewpoint of diaspora, digital diaspora. So um, just by way of introduction, I've been a huge fan of Hank's for a long time. And I met Paula Crown in Aspen and um, when I was giving a keynote for the Aspen Ideas Festival. And I was like, she is super cool. So we ended up uh, just, you know, Aspen is where I've been for the last several months. Um, and I go jogging on this one crazy mountain uh, called um, Ajax Mountain. And Hank has been at Anderson Ranch uh, from time and again. So we thought it would be a fun situation to kind of do a last series of discussions and debates before the election of November 3rd. And as I'm sure all of you have been experiencing, there's huge lines, there's been a tremendous amount of political intrigue about access to voting, and above all, the ideology of voter suppression, which is actually a, a sort of a reconstruction, or literally a, a reconstruction of what happened during the reconstruction after the Civil War. These kind of issues have been lingering over the entire voting cycle. So Hank is an artist whose work I think resonates with a critique of the American ideology of post-Civil War um, kind of re, you know, rec reclamation of rights. Um, and Paula is an artist who actually, I think you guys should check out a little bit more of her work. And I'm hoping everybody, you know, the takeaway is that um, she's an artist and some an activist. So let me just give a little bit of preface and then we'll dive in and ask Hank and Paula because I'm fascinated with their friendship because they, first and foremost, they're friends. And that's a powerful thing across this time of division and everybody being in their own crazy silos. So um, there's five freedoms enshrined in the first amendment of the constitution. Most of, uh, hopefully you guys are aware of that. We don't have to do a civics lesson here. 
Um, but you know, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, and the freedom to petition. Um, Hank Willis Thomas's update of that or remix goes for the four freedoms, which is resonant with what President Roosevelt did right after um, the um, the war, you know, World War II. These things were sort of used to create the the framework where people thought of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, that was championed by Eleanor Roosevelt. I'll let Hank and Paula get into that, but I do want everyone to realize that we are in a time where no no uh, ideology is stable, no social construct is stable. And we're not just in a pandemic, we're in an information pandemic where ideology of racial supremacy, um, toxic notions of late capital and the, the, the sort of supercharged stock market, um, all of those things are a legacy to me at least still of the critique of the, the collision of civilizations of the civil war. Um, if you look at the Southern agrarian versus rural uh, and the Northern industrial cultures, uh, the African-American diaspora charted that kind of complex relationship to capital. Um, so I wanna kind of begin with a quick question to Paula and to Hank about the legacy of the Work Progress Administration, WPA, and the time of crisis coming out of the depression uh, that Roosevelt really kind of helped use the arts to leverage cultural capital to reboot the economy. And I think Hank, your work sometimes critiques both the economics of perception um, how people's roles and their identities can be portrayed in both photography, installation art. And Paula, some of your work is dealing with scalability and larger versus kind of a critique of hyper-consumerism. And again, let me know if I'm mischaracterizing that because I definitely want to be corrected. Um, do you guys want to just riff for a second about how you started your conversation as friends? What's the history? Sure, sure. sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. Hi everyone, it's great to be here um, with you all. Thank you, Paul, um, and to Fong and to Malvika and to the Brooklyn Rail for bringing us together. Paul and I have been friends for a bit. We became friends in um, 20s. Actually, we met through Theaster Gates, I think in 2014, maybe. And we became friends in 2016 when uh, Four Freedoms had just begun. and and we were doing our inaugural exhibition at Jack Shaman Gallery. And one of um, the early supporters of us said that we should really look at the work of Paula Brown, whose work at the time was really focusing and continues to on uh, climate change and especially the complicity of um, the oil industry in kind of keeping certain really critical information hidden. By coincidence, the same influ inspiration that she was working off to make her that work was something that I, I, I had also found in, which was an, an old ad for Esso um, where they talked about global warming in the 60s, but they talked about it as a braggadocio thing. <laughs> and I, I found it and I was like, what should I do with it? What should I do with it? And so when I saw that Paul had already figured out something to do with it, I was like, okay, me and this person have to connect and we've been good friends ever since. Uh, Paula? Um, I, I just want to say it's the power of art to connect people. You know, we, we connected about ideas and the way of manifesting those ideas. And um, thinking about that, that first work, <clears throat> which is called Humble Hubris, um, I think about this often uh, in relationship to your work, All Lies Matter. Um, this was based on an ad from 1962 where Humble Oil was bragging about how uh, many tons of glaciers they, they melted every day. And um, during that same time, information was being suppressed about uh, climate change and, and the, the dangers of, uh, of fuel, uh, fossil fuel emissions. And um, the, the opportunity to get that out there, to have that discussion um, it is something that Hank and I talked about from the early, uh, the early days. And this uh, touches on so many issues of so many artists. Uh, when, when Hank and, and Eric conceived of this whole idea for freedoms and engaging artists, um, in a more public way, creating uh, these platforms for discussion and um, 
and and solutions. Uh, I, I was just so jazzed to to jump on board and um, have continued uh, uh, to support efforts in 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 so many ways um, because I so deeply believe the world needs more artists and creatives and innovative uh, thinkers. Uh, and just like with the WPA, um, it, it was a time where um, talents were, creatives were, were tapped to um, rebuild the infrastructure and, and also to make these beautiful spaces um, uh, that, that transcended, um, uh, Tra transcended what uh, it was truly, uh, truly important about um, uh, democracy and our unity as a country. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, wanted... this, go ahead. No, yeah, go on, Paul. Well, for me, at least, the, the, the di dialectic between both of your work is that, Paula, you're coming out of the Chicago situation, and Hank, Obviously, the legacy of some of the issues that you've looked at with um, archival photography and graphic design. Let's talk about some of the design issues implicit because the Works Project Administration, if, for those in the audience who aren't aware, it really helped get the artists recovering from the Great Depression. And artists were given a certain amount of um, stipends from the government to create murals, to write poetry, you name it. And um, it actually helped reboot and restart the Harlem Renaissance, which I think of Hank's work as kind of uh, definitely engaging with some of those kind of um, convergent issues, uh, African American progress, and above all, um, thinking about the, the politics of perception. So there's there's that kind of advertising component, like advertising for a different world or something. You know, like when I saw your uh, billboards, that's what I was really thinking. But I remember Apollo was heavily involved in kind of getting that as an uh, sort of a whole movement. All you guys have been all fifty states, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So currently we have. Over 70 billboards by over 77 artists in all 50 states, plus DC, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the American Virgin Islands. I did want to go back a little bit and talk about how, uh, well, as we, as Paul was speaking, I was speaking, I was like, oh, Paul, <laughs> we have Paul, Paul, and Hank, but Paul's work, uh, you're probably the first and only artist whose, whose work really has intersected so perfectly in between mine and Paula's um, work because you both have made work around uh, climate justice, climate change and uh, racial justice. And uh, so thinking about um, uh, the, that kind of intersection that happens in your work, uh, I was probably uh, definitely very much inspired by your remixing in the rebirth of the nation. And um, a lot about and, and that gave me a little bit of audacity uh, to think about how else we might reclaim Americana or claim Americana or American ideals which are are kind of universally positive <laughs> um, towards um, something that we might actually eventually all be proud of and Four Freedoms was really very much inspired by the Works Progress Administration and the Farm Security Administration, where there was a time when the United States government recognized that, that in order to put the country on track, they needed to not only employ, but also elevate and support the work of artists. And many of the ways in which our, our society has lost its way over the past 150 years is the kind of marginalization, marginalization of the arts and artists to kind of a, a, a decorative and or kind of esoteric realm. This billboard uh, is from our 2018 campaign with Four Freedoms, it was in Los Angeles and it is by Paula Crown. It is used text that we've all heard many times before. I think never framed more perfectly and this is over top of one of her paintings. Paula, I, you wanna talk about how you came to make this work? So um, I, I, I've just been so touched by the um, by the, the this phrase and its circular nature and how do you break uh, this cycle? And the, the one thing that that artists and art can do is hopefully get people to pause because once you've paused, then you've opened up opportunities 
to possibly act differently, to um, uh, get out of your, uh, you know, our reptilian uh, fight and flight brains and get into our prefrontal cortexes where, where we can actually um, make space to, to act with our heart and, and to think outside of ourselves. Um, what, what's interesting is, is this has been uh, based on a work that has carried through to Four Freedoms uh, on a cape um, that, that Hank so um, artfully modeled and wore. Um, and, and so it's the, the idea that these artistic ideas can get, get carried through um, uh, in important ways. Okay, well, let's unpack that because I think both you and Hank are dealing with public space and how we navigate that. And then of course, given the time frame of how billboards, public spaces sort of shape public ideology, um, I thought it'd be great. Can we show a couple more of the slides of the billboards? These are all put throughout um, different cities. And, um, and again, as Hank was saying in all 50 states, but um, there are usually a critique of both the linguistic you know, appropriation, which is what Paula was saying, say for example of phrases that we might see in advertising but then again there's a kind of a, a very purist design approach where uh, Hank and his people have researched um, earlier movements of, of American signs about progress um, and again that comes out of that 1930s graphic design revolution but there's also other kind of things like if you look at um, Soviet or other kinds of um, ideologies of propaganda like this one is very Soviet but, but with the black power vernacular, you know, uh, red, mm -hmm. black, and green, um, things like that. So, I mean, Hank and, and Paul, because of these projects are so broad, if you guys want to dial in on any particular specific one, just just let uh, let us know and we'll call up that slide. Hank, I, I think your you're Make America Great Again um, played such an important role in uh, evoking emotions. You want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. So. John Santos, White Gallery, and Eric Gottesman and I uh, were brainstorming a lot of on, about kind of what kind of billboards we might want to make in 2016. And we only put up 14, I think, in 2016, um, and did maybe some bus stops, et cetera. But what, we, what happened uh, was we came across this image by Spider Martin through his daughter, Tracy Martin. And um, it's of the Selma to Montgomery March, uh, when uh, on the Edmund Pettus Bridge or just over it, John Lewis, the late John Lewis, civil rights leader and former uh, rep how, you know, representative of the United States Congress, um, with many others, um, attempted to peacefully march from, from the 50 miles from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, for voter to raise awareness for voter registration and voting rights. Um, they were met by the Alabama State Troopers and called an unlawful assembly in spite of the First <laughs> Amendment and um, were given two minutes to disperse. And this is that two minute warning. And after that, they were uh, attacked by the police with uh, dogs and tear gas and sticks. Um, and uh, through it all, they remained uh, nonviolent. They were, remained dignified and strong. And a few days later, famously, Martin Luther King came to join this march, and so did thousands of others. And it was it it, it was completed, um, and uh, I think a more powerful, more heroic way because of the the dignity with which the un the disempowered were able to face the powerful, and. One of the things that was fascinating to me in the $2 billion that was spent in the 2016 election was that no one asked, when was America greater for more Americans than it is today? And I think the answer then is the same as now, which is never. Um, yet, if you were to find a time when America might have been greater, conceptually it would have been moments like uh, the civil rights movement when uh, ordinary everyday people stood up nonviolently for justice and the world was forced to listen. And so this was the, the, the this was our proposition. We put this billboard up in Pearl, Mississippi, along the same highway, um, Route 80, uh, that the, that this, uh, this, um, the, the march took place. 
and uh, we wound up getting a huge response from, you know, as far as many people who are seen as left wing thinking that we were enabling police and violence to so people on the, except the right wing, um, saying that it was racist for undisclosed reasons <laughs> and it start, sparked racial division. And we realized that what good art does is it provokes questions, whereas we, and good design answers them. And we feel like the quality of the question dictates the quality answer. So we took it upon ourselves to put more questions out in the world through the form of these collaborations with different artists. Mm -hmm. And you know, what's beautiful about that is like design is a vernacular that, uh, that seeps throughout all life. Like a chair is an ideology, a table, it can it can actually give you a whole sense of the person's aesthetic there. I mean, you know, whether it be a chair, whether it be an architecture um, intervention like um, the Astor Gates does, what you guys are doing, at least in my perspective, is is opening up the vernacular right now because the billboard as a public space, it's it's a place where a lot of artists from maybe James Rosenquist, for example, he started out painting huge billboards in Times Square. Um, but you guys are resonant. He would do that more as a political observant like observation whereas you guys are much more um kind of proactive with actually changing people's ideology of public space um and hank some of your work obviously you know looking at archival materials your some of your recent photography has been doing a lot of historical layers do you find it that that sort of photoshop approach um the, and the approach of collage um how does that affect your sense of public space too uh because these billboards are very public very open Um, Hank there? <laughs> yeah, it occurred to me that most of the oh, okay. images that we see in public space are encouraging us to buy things. Right. And, you know, that is, I think, a huge waste of the opportunity when you get to speak to millions of people, which these billboards do. Can we also um, sell ideas, new ideas, challenging ideas, challenging questions? And that's why I go back to, I mean, I don't know what your billboard is this year, Paula, but oh, I did, I saw it in sketch form, but the, um, the, um, what are you for? What are you for? Oh, duh, the, what are you for? The balls. Duh. Right, right. <laughs> I thought you were doing the Statue of Liberty one, which uh, I also wanted to, so what was the question that you had for that one? Um, just, uh, I, no, I was going to, I was asking Paula, I had a question. Uh, Paula, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, with Statue of Liberty. Mm -hmm. uh, what we miss when I'm gone. Um, and I think what was amazing in our deep dive with Statue of Liberty, uh, we initially uh, spoke about using that image and you uh, talked about how it means very different things for different people, particularly for those who were brought here uh, against their, their will uh, um, in, uh, uh, to, to be slaves. And so um, what we, uh, we found out was the whole idea of the Statue of Liberty was conceived by an abolitionist. And um, they wanted to represent this new idea um, of freedom for all in, in America. And um, initially the statue was holding chains, uh, broken chains. And uh, that was considered to be too controversial, um, but there are chains in fact around the feet of the Statue of Liberty. And um, I was going to extract that image out and I tested it on some people and people had no idea what that was and what, what the image was. The, the, the idea that this, um, this statue of, of unknown gender, really of unknown uh, ethnicity, um, bearing our values, uh, was was something that um, uh, w w was just so exciting and so important to reveal. And I um, I want to, in some way, bring that forward um, in a subsequent um, All right, now. subsequent. <laughs> T typical me. I'm like, I asked you about the thing that we didn't do. <laughs> um, right, right. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the reason that, that, that what that brings up for me, though, is that we forget that the Statue of Liberty is an artwork. You know, exactly. That, that it is, it actually is, you could call it propaganda. It is 
the one of the largest and most prominent monuments in the world. And it was driven largely by an artist's vision and, an, and a concept and a, and a value that was being pro proposed. And I think billboards also function in that way. They're kind of a, an easier canvas, you know, from a photographer's perspective than, you know, building an island. <laughs> but the same, but I think the, the, this work really, I, and the work that Four Freedoms is doing, the work that I think many of us here, all of us are doing, is continuing the work of the, the unfinished work of the abolitionists. You know, that there is an infinite emancipation uh, movement that um, will likely never be complete um, in our lifetimes because there is so much, there was so much done to confine and limit us and, and separate us from, from, our, from ourselves and each other. And that's why I was gonna say that that hurt people, hurt people billboard really hit me when I realized that we're all hurt. <laughs> we're all actually in pain and recovering from different things. And we're not even also often acknowledging that when we're, when we're offering support to people, we're not acknowledging that when we sit down and share food with people, we're not acknowledging that when we get, come give a talk, <laughs> that I might be bringing some unresolved and un, un, unacknowledged or even and definitely unhealed pain to the space that I'm in. And what does that awareness, the response, what responsibility is that awareness of myself uh, require as I engage with others who might also be hurt. And then <laughs> if we're constantly hurting ourselves and each other, how do we move on towards towards uh, greater liberty and opportunity? And that's where the love over rules comes in. And um, you know, Hank, I, I, that's- I, 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 oh, Can ahead. I just pick up on that? Because yeah. now we're, um, uh, uh, Hank and I get into our, uh, our deep convos here. Um, uh, so w when I think about um, the the brokenness, uh, the hurt people, you know, we're all broken. And by admitting that, embracing that, then it brings open the, the need to help heal each other. And also the idea that there is strength in the broken parts. Um, it, again, it, it goes back to the whole idea that uh, the, these billboards, these artworks create a moment to pause, to open up to a larger conversation that transcends language or transcends some particular short-term urgency. And uh, just finishing up the Statue of Liberty, you know, you have something that was conceived by an abolitionist, made by an artist, and it's a monument to ideas. And, and that's why taking down all of these other statues um, it, it is, really, it is really important. The ones that are commemorating generals and um, uh, people that probably shouldn't have been honored, um, but the ideas, making art, uh, manifesting art it, are the things that, that will endure and continue to give to viewers. You know, and to try and get in between what you both are saying is like, I was mentioning earlier how we navigate public space, but the beauty of this last year, if, this is probably one of the worst and weirdest years most people are tuned in. Um, 2020, I cannot wait to this year is over. But it's been incredible to see how people have been pushing back have been against this notion of fixed format memory, like pulling down statues, uh, spray, spray painting them with graffiti, uh, you name it. And it's been incredible to see the the false equivalence that the Trump administration will do about preserving white history as, as a legacy of supremacy. I mean, there's a very famous statue of um, Theodore Roosevelt being held up by an African slave and an Indian in front of the mm -hmm. Natural Museum of History here in New York. Or I, the list could go on. Growing up in Washington, well, D.C. And, and that's that's being taken down too. I was just talking to Ellen yeah. Sutter, uh, and, she, and, and that's so important. Yeah, and so it, it quietly went. If there wasn't any like mm -hmm. crazy, I mean, it was a, a very egregious statue. Um, and every time I walked by it, it made you feel this sense of like annoyance, like you'd see it and you're like, man. <laughs> um, and you know, do you guys have so many different vectors? I want to kind of riff with you on one of which is the Theaster Gates architecture connection. Cause I know uh, Paula, you're very interested in architecture. 
Can we riff on that for a little bit and some of your thoughts about the city versus rural experience? Because you moved between Aspen and Chicago, which are two radically different uh, geographies. Any any thoughts on that? Sure. Um, well, uh, fast are so extraordinary, um, and, and we've had a chance to work together. Um, we did a project together in Miami. I think, Hank, that was the first time um, that, that uh, we actually did meet. And um, I got to meet your mom. Um, and uh, it was a project where the Astro Studio helped uh, conceive the 3,500 square foot project. It was all made of abandoned uh, wood from abandoned housing. And, um, you know, that's another creative um, ethos is how do we reuse things? How do we um, uh, not just toss them away? Uh, and the whole idea of displacement, right? From, uh, from the, the Midwest to transpose to Miami. So one can experience um, uh, the, the materiality and, and the forms in a new way um, it is something that the Astro does so well and, and something that I continue to, to think about recontextualizing with spaces. Mm -hmm. And Hank, I mean, do you feel architecture, because I know your work is interdisciplinary at pretty much every level. And given that we've now pivoted to this whole like sort of COVID so, social space, um, I mean, billboards are a part of a public expression, but there's also how people think about the sort of social sculpture, whether it be Joseph Boys and his earlier work. I feel like your work triangulates between what Rauschenberg was engaging, Amiri Baraka's sense of poetry, and then people like Max Roach. With he has this one great album called "We Insist" that's a triptych. It's he calls it an audio triptych, um, and you know these are things I've seen your work evolve, Hank, over the years. Um, whereas I'd love to hear maybe because 2020 is one of these weird years where even doing art in a functional social space is like contested. We're not there's a lingering uncertainty over everything. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Um, can we go? Yes, yeah, so this is the 2020 awakening. This is a Four Freedoms Wide Awakes collaboration. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Um, so thinking about um, social sculpture, thinking about new architectures, of course, within my part, a portion of my practice, I've had, I've, I think thought a lot about that because I've been, I was a, a commissioner for the public design commission for the city of New York for about five years. And I also have been doing public art in various ways for, uh, I guess, 15 years. And even the, the level of rules is on the side of a building and that the architecture of that building plays a role in, in, in the making of the work. Uh, but we have also been thinking a lot about other forms of architecture and going back to the Bible, uh, Matthew something, <laughs> the parable of the builder, where it, um, it, we learned that the house built on, on a weak foundation can't stand the storm. And um, we know that the house upon which our country was built <laughs> was uh, an entirely weak foundation because it was built on uh, racism, genocide, homophobia, and sexism. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, until we prepare, we truly commit to pre repairing the foundation, we will not actually reach our, um, have, a, have a strong house. And, and a lot of the ways in which we've been stuck um, are through finite thinking. These, uh, you used a great phrase earlier, I can't remember what it was, but this idea that there's a fixed kind of format for achieving and making history, for achieving the ideals that we aim for and not looking at them and, and, and realize, not paying attention to the other truths, which are that there are infinite games. There is an infinite game. That's the game that we as a, as a species have been playing for hundreds of thousands of years which has kept us alive. And within the context of Four Freedoms, we thought we might want to try to apply some knowledge about games and gaming to the work that we do. And so we came up with this infinite playbook, which you can find at fourfreedoms.org and um, read, oh, look at my shirt. 
I'm my ancestors' wildest dreams because this is uh, by an artist named B Mike because there is ancestral intelligence that's embedded in our DNA that we have not figured out how to access. And we cannot be taught that. So I want to ask you, Paul, to read rule number one of the infinite game and then Paula, rule number two, and then Malvika, rule number three, please. Sure, okay, you ready? All right. One, uh, no one plays alone. You know nothing, you need to know. The rules always change, love overrules. Two, there are no gatekeepers. Bring people into play. Be where you are. Carry your own trash. Three, <clears throat> learn from feeling. Let love nur quiet fear, nourish joy. Go from there. And I'll read drill number four. You're just in time. Leap before you look. You know everything you need to know. Together we are awake. And seriously, don't take yourself too seriously. Play on player. Uh, yeah that reminds me of herman hess um you know steppenwolf there's this um this kind of uh plot where people are playing ga or the bead game sorry herman hess is one of my favorite german writers um but there's this kind of sensibility to your work hank where there's that playful irreverence for how people think about the silos and that's something um this game you know you're using magritte on one hand and um the recycle symbol on the other and the playful sense of appropriation and willful collapsing of these boundaries between, again, like formalist painting, um, collage photography, and digital media, and then, of course, social activism. These are, that is a games theory. I mean, the fun thing about games theory applied to art, um, there's a couple artists who've been making art out of artificial intelligence, and then doing what you call machine learning, which is based on rules. I mean, you have, the more simple the rules, the more complex the game can be. So um, this is a, it's a real treat to see that. Um, has, has anybody made work based on this or how does this work? Well, we're asking you all to play the infinite game with us. This is like what, what a part of that is in the, we within our, what we did is we created this 2020 awakening campaign, which mm -hmm. we collaborated with many others, including Paula, um, to uh, reawaken a 20 and an 1860 uh, abolition movement called the, the Wide Awakes, realizing that those um, advocates, those abolitionists were not perfect. They were not, not, not even, not even, not racist. <laughs> they were hugely problematic, just like <laughs> us. Yet, yeah. yet still they did incredible, I would say heroic things. And they didn't do it alone. It was an intersectional movement. The Republican party was founded as a pro-abolition, pro-women suffrage movement. And by 1860, it was also a pro-immigration party. And they, mm -hmm. and the fact that they had a president six years after they were born uh, is incredible when you think about the power of storytelling. And they did that through performance. They wore they wore cloaks and capes, and they made noise. And they 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 actually created a model for nonviolent uh, creative civic action, which we're now calling civic joy. And so, over the past year, we've been channeling in different ways through um, some degree of cosplay. This is these incredible capes that Paula made. Um, I look, I, that's me on the left in case you couldn't tell. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but we, we, you know, we collaborated with many other artists to, to Kambuya Lashimi and Anya M. Chi, um, Kobe Kennedy to make capes as well. Um, and have gone out into the streets in various ways and um, to, to uh, rally and um, energize our community. So. The, the, the mission right now is to um, kind of create a space in the civic conversation for listening, healing, and justice, and that we can only enter that space through a space of joy. Carrie Mae Weems said to us that there's a lot of room for seriousness and play, but not a lot of room for play and seriousness. And so we have to find this uh, at this kind of methodology that allows us to experiment and keep in the state of play where if we're too busy trying to win, we can get caught up on the small uh, values and the small opportunities. So for instance, if whoever ran, wins on Tuesday, it's that's part of a finite game, right? But mm -hmm. the actual infinite game is the game that actually thinks about how do we stay alive for another, two, another 200,000 years? How do we project into the future a mentality that um, does not uh, create a self-destructive civilization. 
Um, and, and these are the things that we we feel like only artists can do, only the creative community and those invested in it can do because we actually love to live on the edge of the uncertain and have actually found solace there and even joy. And that's so, so we're hoping that everyone can begin to apply these methodologies that keep us from being stuck in our silos and taking ourselves too seriously, seriously to this larger infinite game. That's yeah, and cool. It, and, yeah. and artists, um, I, I think by nature, um, are innovative thinkers. Um, uh, when people ask us, uh, all three of us on, on the call, uh, um, think outside of the box, we, we all just say, well, you know, where's the box? And, and that sort of um, open thinking, innovative mind model, um, and also courage. So, so courage, uh, when you think about the derivation in, in, in French uh, from, from the heart, and their artists put themselves out there. It's a pretty vulnerable place. One other thing about the wide awakes that were so remarkable, not only was their engagement and celebration about the importance of voting and participating, um, many uh, went to serve in the Civil War to fight for their, their, uh, their important values. And that idea of accountability is something that needs to be underscored today. Uh, there's so much, you know, acting with impunity without consequences. And I think bringing the conversation back to um, having your word matter or to have um, really um, respectful conversations, um, you know, to avoid this whole call out culture where uh, we want to respond before we really, um, uh, process and understand where the other person is coming through. So artists um, are, are really primed or, or creatives uh, for this contemporary time. No, that's so cool. You know, I, I, I remember, I mean, by the way, Hank is on the cover of Vanity Fair coming up, the disruption issue. So I chuckle Yay. about um, the, the whole idea that fashion and art have been somehow put out of the political conversation. I mean, I'd like to, Hank, both Hank and Paul, you guys have used this phrase, making space in the civic discourse. And if you go back to the founding of even like Plato's The Sense of the Republic, um, the control of the arts and music was a critical component for the philosophy, the foundation of Western philosophy. I mean, uh, it's been really fascinating to see, um, philosophically speaking, like the legacy of the ashes of the enlightenment, like how people are no longer thinking about, you know, the, the founding of the French Republic was, you know, liberty, liberté, fraternité, égalité, and so on. But the Trump administration has, has really ripped off the band-aid of this American flaw, as Hank was saying, um, to kind of show white supremacy as this strange, involuted grievance. Um, like they, the complaint culture that the Trump demographic seems to really, um, you know, kind of grapple to and really grab onto, it goes back to Hitler and the Weimar Republic, you know, what they call the stab mm -hmm. in the back. Um, and I think we're at that Weimar Republic moment where you're, you guys' art is kind of um, provoking these questions. And I, I find that very refreshing. Um, so well, one thing, yeah, go ahead, Hank. No, no, ask your question. Yeah. Oh, what I was gonna say is the next step here, we're looking at, I think fascism as a component of the Trump sort of scene. And most of the people that come out of his administration, whether it be Steve Bannon, he produced documentaries. Um, Mnuchin, who's the secretary of the treasury, he even produced Wonder Woman. People don't seem to know that. But a lot of the Trump administration, their plan B is going to be to set up a TV network if he loses. I don't know if you guys yeah. have heard about that. I heard that. Mm -hmm. Do you have any comments on that? Because like the, the notion of the cinematic kind of like malevolence yeah. of the Trump people and what you guys are doing is sort of an antidote to that. Well, I mean, I don't know if they're any more malevolent than the rest of us, you know, <laughs> I mean, if, 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 you, if, if they were, how could they, how could we possibly have allowed them to come to power, <laughs> you know, or even get that close, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. there's a level of complicity that all of us have in allowing and creating the opportunity for uh, Donald Trump to become president. And anyone who doesn't claim a responsibility for it actually should really think about how they expect to make change. Because I, I 
see myself as part of many of the problems that I'm trying to fix, you know, and what Donald Trump has taught us, much like Hitler, is that if you're a good artist, you can convince people to do anything, even horrible things that are against everything they believe. You know, Hitler also studied art, right? And uh, that what I have come to understand is that they might be really great storytellers, but we collectively are definitely better. <laughs> and what I think I'm most excited about is raise, being, you know, rising to the occasion to use my creativity to actually build instead of tear down, um, mm -hmm. to, 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 to weave tighter nets and tighter webs and make us stronger. And, and one thing that I wanted to point out, if we go back to the level of rules piece, uh, which is happens to be rule number one, I didn't write all of those rules, but I got to, I got, I, someone included that one in those rules, uh, your level of rules, uh, the neon. Um, what you don't know, Paul, and you, I, mean, I have told you, but you don't know that this this uh, piece has a piece of you in it, you know, because as I, I've probably told you before, my cousin Sunga uh, Willis, who was murdered in 2000, who was my big brother and my closest friend and my mentor, you know, he called himself the subliminal kid. And <laughs> he uh, listened to your records in DC all the time. And he's like, yo, man, there's a kid, DJ Spooky. You know, you got to listen to the tape, blah, blah, blah. And I, and I was just like, DJ Spooky? That sounds spooky. I'm not listening to that. <laughs> um, okay. But he would sign all of his, he, everything he said would say, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd get off the phone saying subliminal. And um, the he started to get into, to like, you know, playing with music, messing with music. And... Um, he was murdered, as I mentioned, and three weeks after he died, a, a friend of his came up to me. and was like, oh, I found this recording of Sangha messing around on the microphone uh, when we were just playing around. And it said, um, uh, the last words he ever said that I heard recorded were love over rules. And uh, you, in your experimentation and your creativity uh, exploration was a major influence in him and literally to the fact that he would <laughs> use one of your monikers as his uh, and so uh, I, I know that when he was making that work and said love of rules uh, as his parting words that he was actually channeling a part of you and that's the that's the power of all of our work is that, they, that we are we are all ripples in our actions and our words and we don't know where they'll end and where they create new ripples. And so I want to thank you and I acknowledging you for giving me that gift to my cousin. Wow. That's a powerful story. And I'm, I'm sorry to hear about him passing. Um, the eerie thing that we look at right now is a legacy of empathy and the ideas that um, how I think the Trump administration lacks empathy at almost every level. There's a sort of sociopathic, uh, psychopathic. I don't even know if they're socio or psycho. I, it, people can argue. <laughs> But what you guys are doing is an antidote to that. I keep using that term antidote because, of course, it has a relationship to sort of information virus or virus or whatever, uh, vac vaccination. Maybe you guys are part of the vaccine against sort of disinformation. And I think that's where empathy and narrative storytelling really kind of um, becomes, makes people become stakeholders in a new narrative. And that's what you guys are doing. Um, Again, it's it's a powerful thing because every day we got we only got five days left, I think, or four days to this election. I, I've been even having trouble sleeping. I guess I'm like, oh, you know, I cannot. I just don't want to wake up on November 4th. Anyway, I'm just I'm, I'm hoping that these uh, you guys are doing this as part of a voter active situation. So that's what's the, the beauty of this as well. If someone um, if you want to text, yeah. you can text awake to three, 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 nine and you can see uh, and engage with our voter engagement tool. But um, there's also a, 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 a group of people called the Resistance Revival Chorus who are part of this Wide Awakes Continuum, which we call it. It's a disorganization with its leaderful, not uh, leaderless, uh, which meaning like <laughs> we follow each other all the time. Mm -hmm. And they've uh, channeled uh, their last wave of the campaign into this uh, idea of bringing joy to the polls. Uh, and yep. if you Google uh, Joy to the Polls, you'll see um, people dancing at the polls and singing. And uh, we've rented um, uh, a uh, someone other, Jason Murphy, uh, Wide Awake 
uh, rented a, uh, a food truck where they're going to be driving around bringing nourishment to people uh, different uh, right, places right. And, and, and playing music. And I know that's happening everywhere. And we deserve to feel happy and excited about every election rather than yeah. fe- feel fo- fearful and, anxi- and have anxiety. Um, I, I did have a question for you, Paul, but Paul, you were going to say something. I, I just say, I just want to say it's so much about everyone using their voices. This goes back to the accountability point. This goes back to the, my project with the I am for. It's about making a statement, not being passive and advocate for things that are, are, are so essential to, to our society for human dignity and respect. And w- when I think about the last four years, the passivity of the, of the good people has been so corrosive. Um, and, and I think silence in its own way is, is a form of violence. And um, uh, w- with the work of the Wide Awakes, with the activation at the polls, with Joy to the Polls, with um, Jose Andreas and, and uh, his whole crew feeding people, um, we should be celebrating um, this really, really essential uh, right. Uh, 250 years ago, we voted to be citizens, not subjects. And there seems to be an emergence of people um, participating, certainly the uh, um, voting by mail, 60 or 70 million people at this point. Um, so that's that's a, uh, a sign of light that I choose to think about, Paul, as, as opposed to um, <laughs> being up in the middle of the night uh, as as to the um, uh, uh, the potential nightmare ahead. Well, I mean, th- th- do you guys feel that art is that kind of hidden um, assembly or tool that allows us to, like, like Archimedes? He said, "If give me the right place on the planet, I can shift the whole orbit." Um, you know, like a, a big, a, a, the ro- properly paced stick can shift the whole world. Um, you know, and that's that goes back again to sort of early philosophical ideas around art and pure forms, or because you guys are unpacking and bringing art into the everyday, which I think is a powerful. Uh, it's very Duchampian. I mean, I think Hank's relationship both to Rauschenberg and to Duchamp on one hand, because these are interdisciplinary artists. And then for you, uh, Paul, what I see is uh, that the tradition of public sculpture uh, that's being turned more into advocacy in a way. Um, there's painters like David Wood Winarowicz on one hand in the 80s, who was doing these kind of crazy anti-AIDS uh, sort of prints and posters. Um, and you guys have inherited that sense of progressive use of art. Is, is that a good characterization of that, do you think? Uh, for, from my standpoint, uh, uh, absolutely. You know, uh, art's a language, and um, our job is to continue to figure out the best form to manifest ideas and to connect with people because the art really is completed um, with the viewer and the expanded conversation. I, I love the story about Sangha and uh, his connection with, with you and your work, Paul. Um, and I guess the thing that's so frustrating for me is art has been around since the beginning of human civilization. And um, we have to continue to bring it forth as a really important part of the dialogue and um, uh, our, our cogitation. Um, you know, art isn't something that you just adhere, uh, that you just put it on a t-shirt to up its game. It's really something uh, that's an idea embodied. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a great summary. And I, I guess I do want you to answer that for yourself, though, Paul, because when yet yeah, I think you you can be sometimes you don't you you don't talk about um, the other thing behind. I know there's your personal interest in the work, but there's also what, something that I'm waking up to, which is like the ripple effect. Like someone might see, uh, people right. are like, oh, I saw your piece and I was like, oh, I should be an artist. I'm like, what, you saw it, you know? <laughs> and um, the fact that we, when we manifest something, when we make something, that's what I think about with uh, some of Paul's work as well. It's like, we're leaving an impression on the world and leaving an impression on others. And what responsibility does that, or, if it, or not, you know, what does it do for you when you know that, you know, your work is and can and will affect tens of thousands, likely millions of people like that stick. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that's that's the beauty of our time is that I think the Trump demographic 
they've absorbed a narrative that is kind of looping in their mind. I mean, the, the technical term is called semantic infiltration or ne neuro-linguistic programming. And it's basically where you repeat certain phrases mm -hmm. and ideology kind of uh, catchphrases, which again, Hitler and the, he was one of the first people to use radio and TV. And then you had on the other side, you had Roosevelt with his fireside chats, for example. So you guys are doing kind of an update of that fireside chat, but with the entire 50 states and these billboards, but it's it's an intimate but public conversation about empathy. Um, and that's what I've, so far I've, I've found that as a really a uh, beautiful component of both you guys as artists as friends and also as people who have who are open enough to learn because that's it's the problem with the trump demographic you cannot reason with them and it's like the president as malware you know he's kind of gotten into mm -hmm. the system and like <laughs> <laughs> you know um but just these are good you, i love hearing your arsenal of antidotes that's kind of my my pun here is uh, i like the term intimate yeah. public dialogue you yeah. uh, know i also think it's important for us to reconsider i mean i love duchamp I definitely would be making art form for Duchamp and Rauschenberg. I also am trying to come to terms with something as an African American who has is generations removed from um, um, true um, rich African traditions, which is that Duchamp was just making bad African art. Right. <laughs> but like conceptual <laughs> art is is African art. If you if you mm -hmm. if you're at all trying to deal with modernism you're actually dealing with african ideas and mm -hmm. there's a, the the erasure f uh, of africa from modernity is something that i think doesn't allow us that like that's our gateway back into the infinite game because it's not a coincidence at the same time that colonialism took took root in, in africa um, and at the same time that industrialization started to take root all over the world that we started to use finite resources and have in basically the course of 160 years almost choked the the planet to death mm -hmm. uh and, and so uh, one of the ways out is through these uh more infinite forms of thinking and working which uh i do i, I believe people like uh rauschenberg people like duchamp or have been pushing and asking us to to work with and actually uh, can we go to paula's Times square thing um that where that that says it all, you know, this, she talks about it about in one way, but this hashtag solo together um, is kind of to me says it all that like we are one world and we all are are alone, but also together, and the the the, the good, the bad, the ugly we make <laughs> solo together. That's so cool. I mean, Paula, you do you want to talk? I mean, because these are still public space; they're still. An intimate you're doing the sort of poetry of objects because I, I view a lot of your work that converges both of you guys and again let me know if i'm mischaracterizing this on a use of language to repurpose visual um so there's a linguistic i mean hank there's always been a linguistic component to your work and paula i've seen your work as large-scale objects and then these billboards you guys want to triangulate and riff on that i mean hank that was a great i love the idea of duchamp making bad um African art, because if you look at Picasso, if you, you know, the list goes on of the people who appropriated from Afro-Cuban or surrealism, et cetera. Yeah, it's- I mean, it's pretty Western art and I'm a Western artist, so. Well, I'm not hating. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the essential thing is um, to, to look at the canons that we have in our institutions, whether they're museums or universities, and, and we have to be clear-eyed about what's been left out. Um, so many canons, uh, traditional canons, are white, Western, and male. And uh, I, I think about potential, uh, I think about expanding the story, right? So if, if Trump and his approach, his subliminal seduction, his narrowing has um, uh, made people fear, fearful and closed in, I, I think the potential to think about what was happening in, in 1940 in Latin America and with women artists and with black artists and African artists, um, that's just gonna enrich our human story. And um, I'm really committed to, to asking that question. Uh, we know that nature is more vital and more um, sustainable when it's more complicated and diverse. 
And I think we need to go back to that place about the larger conversation and um, uh, expansionism in, in, the, in the best way in terms of our minds. Hey, Paula, I got to point out something. So I also believe that hey, we're all, that we're all <laughs> artists. Like what I, what I talked about with, 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 with Paula, my cousin, is something that I've come to also wake up to. I've had is a year of awakening for me, which is that we're psychic. Like and and it, through a different lens, uh, through an anti, through a non-colonial lens, if you look at what we in creative field curators, artists, even entrepreneurs do, architects, is that we we see a vision, and then we make it real, like literally, like we live mm -hmm. in the future. Nothing we do. And have you ever looked at this picture closely and realized a, a huge irony about your solo, solo together work? Do you see that sign? Uh, to the, the sign to the left. It's also blue. Expand it. Oh, alone together. <laughs> yeah, alone together. <laughs> and, and how crazy is it that like you've been doing a solo together, thinking for years, and then right. at some point during a pandemic, these terms make so much. It's it's like literally made ready made for the moment. And mm -hmm. over there somewhere else, some like the hashtag is alone together. <laughs> and what a lot I'm aiming to do is for us to, now that we know that we are like, that's you and whoever did that have, have a mind meld somewhere, a tele mm -hmm. telepathic connection. And along with the curators at, you know, Times Square Arts and what happens if we actually silence our an anxious minds and, and come to a level of awareness that we are all connected and remove the buts and the ifs and the should, coulda, woulda, and I'm afraid I'm concerned into the, and, and acted in pure faith and, and love. Uh, what if we did that as a creative act? How, how could what you and you know all of us are doing manifest? Um, what, what could we manifest? Anyway, I just want well, to make I'm, that all those connections. No, I'm glad you did. I yeah, wanted to share this up. really quick. I wanted to show you guys a quick image that um, that's been going around um, about Ilhan Omar, who's the, the congressional representative. Her and AOC and the squad have drawn a tremendous amount of heat, and I just thought that this is this is very resonant with both Hank and Paula. Um, and I just love the, this phrase: "If your freedom relies on my oppression, then neither of us is free." I agree. And you know, these kinds of repurposing of both the space of the internet itself is the, the ancient Greeks called it the agora, the public space of the heart of the city. So when, when I saw Paula's work, I, by the way, Paula, I think I texted you when I was jogging. Um, I've been, I'm a regular runner and the last several months I've been in Aspen, but then when I was in New York, it was ghost town and I'd be jogging at like 10 o'clock at night in the middle of like Broadway or something where there's, where there was no cars. There was, and I think Paula's work uh, was up in the middle of some of this stuff a couple months back, right? Um, but I, tagged, I was mm -hmm. like, yo, your stuff, I just saw, I just jogged past your stuff. And there was literally nobody in Times Square. It was like a science fiction movie. Um, yeah. And the last several months of this notion of New York as a center of anxiety about public space, a lot of people are leaving the city. Um, and that was, it was at least one of those moments of trying to figure about rethinking staying in the city. Um, anyway, it just it was very heartwarming to see that. Um, well, thanks. Um, I, um, you know, I, I, I just think a lot about what, what Hank said about the, the prophetic. Um, I, I think about um, asking the question. Right, it's a balance between not being too didactic with one's artwork, um, but also posing a really uh, important question. And I think if we advance the um, slides there, um, uh, we have Hank's uh, work, um, the, this, the large size pick with people doing yoga and uh, my cup in Miami where people are doing um, ballet. Um, this this cup is uh, is unavoidable, right? It's big, it's red, it's a it's a warning sign, um, and the idea that people are actually interacting with it, thinking about it uh, on multiple levels, is um, is is something I never expected from from an art practice to 
to be the best single part about it. And if we advance next um, to Hank's work, um, I, I mean, this is so extraordinary, right? That um, uh, people are interacting with ideas. This isn't about the statue of Robert E. Lee. This is about a monumental idea that's important that we should think about how to interact with and, and how to behave. And who's working, the, the, the Afro is Hanks, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Just making sure, okay. I, I was like, is Paula making Afro scars? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, hey, you had that go to Burning Man as well, right? It started at Burning Man. Now it's been traveling around the country. It's at, it's at uh, in, it, this was in West Philadelphia. Now it's in North Philadelphia. It's a 28 okay. foot Afro pick where you can see there, you can climb inside and go to the top if you are uh, so inclined and crazy enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the idea hey, of envelop you. becoming the uh, you know embodying the idea um, and connecting with it is is a superpower of art. I I like that superpower. Um, and Hank, the the you, you at Burning Man, I always I I still like was like what? Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Because these are it's a gift economy. It's a place where people you know are all exchanging all sorts of ideas. Uh, a whole bunch of artists go there. Um, is, is, does that play any role like in some of the issues of when you're talking about social sculpture? Everything well, is free. It's meant to be a circular economy and things like that. Is that and, the, and it's 0.0% black. <laughs> 0. Right. 0. <laughs> 0. black. Um, and that's the thing that I think uh, Burning Man is a, it's an infinite it's, it, it's an infinite game, you know, inside the that those finite borders. And uh, they call this world that we live in the default world where like we have to play by where love does not overrule <laughs> yeah where we have to play by <laughs> finite rules and um live uh with finite consequences and there everything is kind of on the edge because you can die at any moment <laughs> um which is also true so a lot of you know i've what i thought about is 2020 they canceled burning man in the playa but we're now living it where we like have to go outside. We had to wear a mask. We should be wearing goggles. You know, every time we talk to somebody, you know, know. is like there's something at risk and there's something at stake. And so we now act as if every moment is precious. You know, every time we do things, we're like, you know, we can try to stay inside forever and weather out the storm. Some of us will. Um, but um, what I learned is that you know, best it's best articulated in Audre Lorde's poem. A litany for survival the last line where she says it's better better to speak knowing we were never meant to survive you know um and i recognize that as an african-american man growing up in the places that i grew up um i'm already living beyond my means <laughs> you know so i best take the make the best of most of it all and why why wait you know, for someone to give me an opportunity when we can just actually make them for ourselves. That's a great, that's a perfect way to think right before this election. Um, so I know time-wise it's 2.10. Fong, uh, Nick or Malvika, how are we for time? Does anybody, um, I wanna make sure to respect everybody's time. And Hank and Paula, if you guys are open to questions too, um, um, you know, everybody be cool, don't go crazy or anything, you know, or if you do go crazy, hey, make it interesting. Um, <laughs> so Fong, Fong, do you want to um, jump so, in or? So yeah, thank no? you all so much. Um, this has been a fabulous conversation and we have a lot of food for thought. Um, our first question will come from the lovely Anya Bernstein. And Anya, you can turn on your microphone now. Thank you. Perfect. Hi, um, thank you so much for this conversation um, and for the work you're doing. I have a question. Um, thinking about, uh, Paula, you, you, you referenced um, the institution of the museum and uh, how it's been you know, historically a place that's excluded narratives that aren't you know, largely white, um, hegemonic, Western. Mm -hmm. um, and there's right now a large conversation about this idea of decolonizing the museum and the tension around like, is it possible to decolonize an institution like the museum or the university or like, uh, you know, the United States, something like that. So I'm thinking about how the work of, you know, uh, 
your billboard pieces and um, the work of the Wide Awakes, um, they all exist kind of outside of the physical space of the museum and merge even into civic action and protest. And I, I'm, I'm wondering if you think the kind of work that you wanna be doing is possible within the context of the museum as an institution um, or you know what, how we can like just deal with that tension of we want to decolonize, but also like the the, the museum is like a really important uh, institution for art for for support. Um, so, so many interesting threads there. I mean, first of all, if <clears throat> is it what is a museum? I think that's a question that that we've been asking. What's what is a university? What's its responsibility? Um, at a time when you couldn't go into the museum, how do you connect with society? How can you be of service um, to, to uh, uh, those who um, need the, the art and the ideas? Um, I, I, so this has been an attempt to move away from objects and uh, this is very Joseph Boisean, you know, the idea that um, it, it, it's the ideas that are alive, the, the concepts that are alive. We, we certainly uh, see that in so much of Hank's conceptual work. Um, so um, I know I'm gonna use my voice and uh, to, to ask the questions um, and, and to um, push for the, the larger point of view, uh, acknowledge where we are, look at it clearly, and then look at how much more expansive that conversation um, could be by uh, broadening out the scholarship. And you, you, you have been using your voice, actually, in, in ways that you don't and shouldn't talk about. <laughs> so I do think that it really is a really complicated time to be um, on a board or affiliated with museums because my wife works at a museum. Um, my mother is a curator um, because the institution is its own living thing, which is separate and larger than all of us. And the solutions that are required to actually address some of the issues are also larger than all of us in and, and there's a, a, a we're afraid we've become afraid of critique um I, I i is the future ancestor here i thought i saw someone that also was speaking to these ideas uh, uh, that might contrast uh um might speak to your question on and i see someone who was in a wide escape is that a future ancestor here no they're not mm. speaking if they are um, because there's this idea of even decolonizing, um, actually it, it forefronts the colonialism, right? Yeah. It's like, let's undo the thing <laughs> that's actually, you know, so there's a finite way in which that frames. And, and, and so one word that, 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 uh, this group resilience 2032 has been working with is, are these new lexicons, uh, um, through their, 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 they did this project where they, imagined uh, the first indigenous uh, presidential candidate um, um, who maybe, oh, there she is. Can you talk to us what you said last week about um, decolonization? Yes, hi, thank you. I couldn't unmute myself. It's really uh, great to be here. Um, we were looking at, and this was also kind of echoed in this conversation already, but the power of our words to shape um, our actions. But can you give and, some context of Resilience 2032 for those who? Sure. Um, thank you. Resilience 2032 is a um, it's part of the Wide Awakes activation. We are Wide Awakes from the year 2032 specifically. Um, that's 12 years into the future, where a Wide Awake candidate, um, an Indigenous woman, uh, is running for president. And thanks to Rand Truth's voting for the first time um, in history, in U.S. history. Uh, an independent candidate has a ch shot at, um, at being elected. And so in the future, um, we have uh, replaced decolonize or with indigenize um, as trying to focus more on what we want to create more of versus, um, yeah, versus uh, uh, repeating systems that are already in place or uh, reinforcing them. So another example is matriating versus dismantle the patriarchy. Um, but th th these are some of the ways that we are uh, using 
um, soft power to, uh, to shift culture um, and to challenge the systems in place. Can you tell us a few other future words? Okay, future words. Um, uh, matriate, uh, indigenize. Um, let's see, we're building a lexicon with the wide awakes and uh, I'm women blind. Mean, what is Sorry? It? She, how do you call it? Oh, hugh, hugh womanity. Um, so, um, <laughs> because we also want to norm. <laughs> like it. Yes. Uh, uh, the, yes. I mean, our, our story versus history or her story. Um, I think our story is the more um, inclusive one. There are, there are more, but the language that we, the language in 2020 or the language, especially um, if we are looking specifically at the English language or for those that, that um, had the privilege to learn other languages, because we also know that, and we talked, to, you talked a lot Today about cultural erasure, um, that language is also part of that. So many of us, um, our ancestors spoke languages that were robbed from us. And so um, normalizing uh, learning different languages or replacing words in the English language that do not serve the, pr the progress um, or the inclusion uh, or the change that, um, that we need. And so uh, as we grow this lexicon, um, we look at the words that we use and, and think about alternatives and it's okay to use other languages as well. And by the way, is that Noor? Yes. Hi, Paul. Okay. Hey, Noor. Yeah, good okay, to see you. Cool. Good to see you. <laughs> Her yeah. name is Future Ancestor within the Wide Ways Continuum. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Mine is. Um, it's brilliant. It's so important. And, yeah. and recontextualizing. Uh, I think about the black balls, uh, the idea of you know, my goal is uh, to have the phrase black ball um, be about uh, inclusion, not exclusion, where it was a process where people were uh, eliminated, were not uh, welcomed into some club and the idea of opening it up and saying no blackballing is, uh, um, uh, is a welcoming idea, a, a uh, affirmative idea. So um, I, I love that, North. Th thank you for, um, <laughs> for for the new vocabulary. Yes, you reminded me of another one, calling in versus calling out, um, and also accountability culture versus cancel culture. Um, yes. More Very cool. I'm adding I, that right now. <laughs> I mean, also, Nora, there's a science fiction relationship to your work. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, science fiction writers like Kim Stanley Robinson, who writes a lot about near future environmental issues. There's also a Colorado based writer named Paolo Basigalupi, who's written um, his most famous book is called The Wind Up Girl. Uh, he uses what you call steampunk or biotech science fiction. It's really smart, really interesting. Um, and Nora's collective is doing some great work. I didn't know that you got you knew Hank or well. Um, um i just got back we don't to really York know song. each other we actually <laughs> don't really know each other that's the beauty of the wide awake is that oh okay we, we we've we've built a friendship because every day monday through friday at 4 p.m everyone is welcome there are these disorientations where we show up and um make new friends and so we 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 yes. we where we, is uh, this can what yeah where is it at your studio no it's on so, zoom so which we can send you we'll drop drop the link in can you drop the link in Yes, I'll be dropping the link in the chat. And I want to just share a very uh, serendipitous moment. Um, also, uh, Mr. Beautiful and I met, but he doesn't remember, in LA during the Four Freedoms Congress, which is a very, which of course, I mean, Resilience is, uh, is part of the Four Freedoms Network. And uh, 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 he connected me to people that made it possible for us to have um, uh, an indigenous woman play um, actually play and write uh, her role because we believe that it's not just about who tells uh, who what story you're telling but who writes the story um, and then Paul walked into our first th the night before we flew to LA to the Four Freedoms Congress Paul randomly walked into our kickoff event the 2032 conversation in New York City so it's kind of serendipitous for us all to be here but you'll see it also if you join this orientations or with the wide awakes um, there are just some really serendipitous magical um synchronistic moments that always unfold yeah and i mean by the way i mean is it your organization or that someone suggested in the chat that we would do a whole conversation about you guys i mean fong maybe this is one I, i've been wanting to do something about the role of science fiction and art right now because i feel like the world 
has felt more and more science fictional in 2020 and beyond. Um, mainly because of like, if you look at narratives, like William Gibson's one of my all time favorite writers and Hank's art could actually be in one of William Gibson's novels. It's um, his, his Neuromancer is one of my favorite, but he always has artists um, where he'll write some you know, really cool story and some really great stuff. Um, and Fong, I see you and Agnes Gund is in the audience as well. Um, Fong, do you have any, um, I, I see you're wearing these sunglasses here. This is, uh, is that, is that normal Fong? <laughs> that that no. it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's because uh, it, I have about 10, 12 zooms sometime a day. Okay. Mm. It's my eyes, so uh, this is helping to cope with the <laughs> with the glaring of uh, the light, you know, from the okay. laptop. But thank you so much, Paula, uh, Hank. Good to see you here. And uh, yeah, I I absolutely feel the necessity of all of us coming together in terms of artists. Um, a good friend of ours, um, artist from LA that you all should meet, named Lauren Bond, and she created this neon that say artists need to create on the same scale that society had the capacity to destroy. So it's a very similar ethos mm -hmm. that we all sort of follow in somewhat and remember that we are smart people, as Hank pointed out. You know, I mean, I, I'm from Vietnam. If you went to French boarding school or be, get sent to Paris or anywhere in France, you go back and you have that assimilated mannerism and that, you know, that education. Therefore, you consider to be intelligent. So we never get a chance to think outside of that um, model, so to speak, you know. So it, it's a very interesting timing, too, because I remember uh, the bombing of Baghdad. I was sitting with David Levi Strauss and thinking some point after uh, whoever ended up choreographed this amazing picturesque, you know, it was what I remember 91, remember shock and awe operation? <laughs> <laughs> so, and I remember thinking of it, you know, it's a fixed vantage point and literally reminded us so much of William Turner the burning of the House of Parliament, you know? And I think in a way we have to take back what, what Hank kind of um, raised early on, um, you know, because so much of his work is about recuperating corporate logos and interject them as a subversive act, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think it reminded me so much of how we forgot also that Mussolini, for example, uh, learned so much from uh, Manoretti, because Manoretti created the Futurist Manifesto as early as 1909. I mean, he didn't, they didn't meet until the end of the war, which is 1918, which is essentially when you think back, what is Futurist art? It's about speed and technology. And I think mm -hmm. exactly how he deployed so brilliantly Mussolini himself, you know, and that's not similar with Trump. Uh, deployment tweak so quick, so fast, unpredictably, but it go further back. I and mean, we know we know how that meant. I mean, Hitler too, when you talk about Weimar Republic, I was so fixated <laughs> on Hitler for so long. I went back to read his autobiography, My Struggle. And he's written my <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because okay. he's so much too. So as Paula also mentioned too, we need to sort of figure out a way to um, generate all these pictorial means, you know, all this visual intelligence. It's a sign, it's a symbol of wherever you can mobilize outside of studio practice, which is what we need to do simultaneously. You can make object uh, in the studio. In fact, we are about to welcome tomorrow. Crystal is a great example. It may not be political mm -hmm. in the normal political sense, but the drawing act, you know, which he done at home. He doesn't want to be bothered by anybody. It's hermetic. But and then the whole other aspect of the work, public commission, is really a, meant to be, a, you know, de dealing with massive bureaucracy. Um, so that's to me, it's something that to be thinking of both. It's hard to just make in work right now um, in, in this time, you know, so I- Right, I mean, and Fong, just to go to what you and Hank and Noor were just saying and to sort of triangulate that with Paula, 
we're, we're in an era of biopolitics. And I firmly believe that the virus has sort of created a situation where radical inequality has created a situation where there's definitely a crisis of access to capital. You're going to be seeing a lot more. I mean, when you look at the Great Depression, what hit the reset button was when Roosevelt really came forward with the Works Project Administration yeah. and said, look, we need to sort of bootstrap the creative economy into change. Um, and so that's where the four freedoms that Hanks has been riffing on kind of resonate with. Um, I do want to um, just say that what I find beautiful about what you were just saying, Fong, is there was a story you mentioned, and this is something that ties with the Hank, um, again, his uh, cousin, Hank, I'm so sorry to hear about your cousin. Um, Fong, you were taken to a re-education camp in Cambodia. Do you remember we were talking about this a little while ago? Because yeah. uh, if you were middle class or educated, they wanted to re-educate people. And the Chinese are now doing this in you know, northwest of China with the Uyghurs. Um, but re-education in a communist context as one of the weirdest. Uh, can you talk, tell that story a little bit? I know that might, it, it's too personal, I understand, but it was a really interesting. Actually, it's, it's very, um, <laughs> it's applied generally to m many of those who have, you know, struggled with the, uh, with communist regime. I mean, this is, this applies similarly to our friend Ai Weiwei. Uh, his yeah. father is a great poet who also was consigned into labor camp. So he grew up seeing his father washing the people's toilet. You know, um, that's all he did, the great poet, you know? So I think that's what happened to my family too. So we, after the war ended in 75, we were, you know, uh, considered to be blacklisted and enemy of the people, so to speak, sent to labor camp. And I didn't get to America till 1980. So we, I were there, we were there for a while. Uh, but the idea is that I think um, when Hank was saying that we also are responsible as complicit individual, absolutely super true about those who understood um, in mm -hmm. order to find power or politics begins with the identification of the en enemy. This is something that is, you see it over and over and over again. And I think in thinking about Trump, you know, he, in Hitler until too, I mean, Hitler rose to power in 33, 34. And I remember clearly the great, another great Weimar figure, the poet, Austrian, even though he's back in Austria, Karl Krauss. He said that the secret of the demigod is to make himself as stupid as his audience. So they too think they are as <laughs> as So we know this is where the role of mm. the two had to be incredibly precise. And, and the whole is more than the sum of its part. This is, we tend to forget it all, you know? And that's why a forum like this is so important. Meeting people, we all busy, but we are seeing each other, meeting each other and sharing ideas. And hopefully we co connect and collaborate. I think that, you know, it's go be young the immigration issue, the global warming issue, uh, whoever ended up winning next t Tuesday, you guys, it, it, it's hap we have work to do. So it's not, it won't right. end there. So I think the more of us getting together, uh, the public sphere, um, the old sense of, <laughs> of the old days of the, you know, John Dewey sense, you know, in the turn century, you talk about the Great Depression similarly, Eleanor Roosevelt play a big role in that and helping to create the WPA. And uh, so this is where we are that time. We are experienced that very similar time. And I'm just grateful that you guys can be here and share the project. And I, you know, want to keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fang. Um, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Hank. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paula. Welcome. Um, and uh, thank you, we thank you to everyone else who we had a number of lovely questions from the audience. Um, but uh, we've come to our poetry hour. So at the rail, we have a tradition of ending lunch with a poem, and we've been lucky enough to carry these uh, into our Zoom events. So today, I'm thrilled to welcome the poet, novelist, playwright, translator, and a number of other things, uh, Rachel Levitsky, to the stage. Um, 
Most versions of Rachel Levitsky's bio open with two historical dates. Rachel Levitsky came out as a lesbian in 1984 and as a poet in 1994, which is exactly the kind of way I think we all should plot the story of ourselves to ourselves. Uh, she's also the author of the novel, The Story of My Accident is Ours, the book length poem, Under the Sun, the poetry collection, Neighbor, which came out with Ugly Duckling Press, who liked it so much, they published it twice. And most recently, Against Travel and Anti Voyage, a hybrid French English text, which uh, came out actually earlier this year with Paminar Press, uh, as well as a number of other small press editions over the years. Uh, in 99, she founded the feminist avant-garde network Belladonna series, uh, which is quite well known and which is now morphed into the fully autonomous and truly collective Belladonna Collaborative. She's a professor at Pratt Institute, where she instructed our very own editorial assistant, Georgia Willis. Um, give it up for Rachel. And Rachel, you should be able. Okay, hi Perfect. everyone. Well, I'm just so grateful and so inspired and I just wanna thank everyone um, involved in this series and this event tonight, today. Um, I'm gonna just, just say one thing, which is that I love intimate dialogue and I hope that you will find a confluence with these poems in that notion. I think, I think that's right. The first one actually starts with the museum and broadening the museum to echo Paula. Against Travel for Suzanne. I came here to the museum in order to move something below the realm of form from the left to the right into bundles of babies by lesbians of all things and older blind children orphaned and parented unafraid of rough touch sensation given them in order to see. The question of what Elizabeth said was part of the dream in which maybe I miss someone I miss every day not false memory about Elizabeth of her moment, that moment when everything happens, happens to her alone. My new friend is writing a book. She eyes me with the depth of something unspeakable, sucking life in the form of skin made papery around her eyes. I want an adjective for that skin, not withered nor brittle or about to crack, more thin, beige, hungry and thirsty easily torn, portmanteau, rejecting frangible for skin flake. She writes in translation, come, life can be simple. And whether I do or not, want to or not, nothing will change for Elizabeth after all these years, ferreting my books in a language she doesn't like to read for a price she can't really afford. While I'm thinking about how far you are, thinking yes, life can be simple, full of easy love, the ever presence of cherished bodies that have passed and the ones that as yet haven't. Against travel for Diana. Where am I and why am I between a man as towering and fat as Charles Olson and a scrawny French kid shucking gender for a rabbit? How many pounds are big and how many measure a kilo in a bar or brick of chocolate. When the bully gets laid, who gets paid for the pleasure? Pussy blockade for the underage's loot tutelage, future fuse or freeze, shelf lives, birds cawing, omens grinning. My big man Stephanie appears. I climb up and stay up against the wall. Impressive, so are you. But what does one do with gravity and the beyond? when, while, all the way up here. The stairs are a holler, her speed a bit daunty. Yes, I do, take it that way. And read Andrea Dworkin for guidance and measure. Is the internet connection okay? I think so, as good as, good as it'll ever be. A sign. Um, um, <laughs> um, against travel for Jack. A thorough intellect doesn't vacate accident emergence of something else. She's a tiger. I'm probably not permitted to call this nature. 
I can't allow myself to call it spirit. Performers might say presence. I, I can say, I can now for, say forgive. And yes, I would like some more. Back to the trouble in referencing animal this way or remind us of what we cannot do no matter our squeezing and pressing and pushing and pushing bodies into walls, asses into genes, plant calories into protein, pleasure to hell. I want to write more here about the chaos in the house, his tantrum to build something empty, hungry for monarchs, abundant the day before today, yesterday. Um, and I'll end with um, a new series I'm calling Audience. And it's about, so it, it, it is sort of about a healing practice in the poetry of moving pers personal solo together intimate reality into public view with the thought of its mate being made public in mind of the writing it. And so they're all for a certain kind of, I guess an intimate audience, but also a broader audience. Audience. And this is for Ted, Diana and Amy and everyone. And I'll end with this. Thank you all again. The idea of meditation is a quieting of mental clamor, a turn toward the function of breath and body, a voluntary movement into involuntary Perhaps what makes me a poet is the weight of that clamor of language, yes, but primal is the weight of the image. As a little girl bearing my body against the noise and violence of family, I was bowled over when in bed at night, I closed my eyes toward a largeness larger than black hole. Then in a wave, my consciousness followed an infinitely tiny disappearing, limitless big and small threatening my mind on a pursuit of each. I think my mind is always trying to solve it, the massiveness of noise and silence. And then I slept, I still sleep. Today, when I meditated, I recalled you and that four years ago, you were about to come to New York City and I was about to go to Tuscany. We got to hold each other and love each other for a little that morning of, of the day after the night beginning our current consuming disaster. I am glad you sent me photos of your new home so I could picture you there before I tried to picture the air of my breath going through branch bronchioles into little sacs, lung. Being the poet, needing an image to conjure what's real, to recall how to breathe. And I wrote that today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, everyone give it up oh, for really Rachel. Um, yes. really. Hey. Uh, really, thank you really so much. Thanks. Rachel, and thank you as well to Paula, Hank, and Paul, and to the Wide Awakes and to all of you who have been here with us today. This month, we are celebrating the 20 year anniversary of the rail, which kicked off in October 2000 with uh, a broadsheet and a philosophy of remaining free, independent, and accessible to all. Uh, and looking back now at all the art, culture, parties, and conversations, and the community of artists and writers and friends, which we've uh, been so lucky to cultivate, we're so happy happy to be celebrating this uh, anniversary with you all with this conversation and uh, to be looking forward to the next 20 years. Uh, please join us again tomorrow for a celebration of the life and work of Cristo and Jean-Claude with Barbara Rose, Lorenzo Giovanelli, and Mohammed Ibrahim Mahama, led by Jonathan Feinberg and our very own Fong H. Vui. That will be, as always, at what 1 p.m. right here in the Zoom. Uh, you can now unmute your microphones and say goodbye as you leave. And I hope you all have a beautiful rest of your day. But thank you so much. Um, and by the way, just to Paula, Hank, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I really appreciate this is very heartwarming. Uh, and Rachel's poems as really, um, uh, these are very dark and cynical times. So even some of these events where we just raise some light up a little bit. I mean, I think what Hank and Paula are doing is very illuminating, very um, heartwarming, and above all, life affirming. Um, so thank you guys, Paula, thank you for your art. Uh, Hank, thank you for your art. And um, Fong, I gotta get some sunglasses like that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so right. much. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank, you right, everybody. thank you guys. Bye, everyone. Great, Rachel. Oh, hi, Robert, Shane, and Baby. <laughs> hi, and Cora behind me. <laughs> Hi, sweetheart. Uh, hey, Robert. Hi. Hi, Fong. What's, Thank what's you, everyone. Can you help me get that? Wow, two of them. Wow. Amazing. Hello. Thank you, Rachel, for the beautiful reading.
So thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Have a great rest of your Thursday. Thank you.